Well, thank you very much for inviting me and for being here. What, what I'm going to talk about today is a little idea that I floated in that little book, The Bottom Billion. And it's an idea which has just become a reality. Um, it concerns uh, natural resource extraction in the poorest countries of the world, um, the bottom billion. And to concretize that, let's think of Africa. Now, natural resource extraction in Africa in the coming decade will be the biggest opportunity that Africa has ever had, and indeed will have for a long time. Now, to convince you of that, first of all, something you know very obviously, world commodity prices are very high. They're high even during the worst world recession for 80 years. The rise of East Asia has moved us to permanently high commodity prices, and that itself is raising revenues from natural resources. But the really big effect is, is another effect. And to convince you of that, we're going to do one number. Imagine here is the typical square mile of the rich countries in the world, the OECD. And we're going to look underneath that square mile. And I'll tell you, underneath that square mile, there are about $300,000 worth of natural assets, subsoil assets. So that's the average square mile of the rich countries. And now we're going to go over here, and here's the average square mile of Africa. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look underneath it. And to make it more fun, at least for me, instead of me telling you, you're going to tell me. Right? To make it manageable, I'll give you a choice. That square mile in Africa, it could have less than the rich countries. It could have more. And you're going to vote. Who thinks it has less? And who thinks it has more? And this is why you're all going to remember this number, because you're all wrong. Right? <laughs> the figure for the rich countries, $300,000. The figure for Africa, $60,000. Only a fifth. What's going on? Right? What's going on? Well, I cheated. The figures I gave you were for known subsoil assets. You know, I tried to find the figures for unknown subsoil assets, and I just, I just couldn't find them. Right? What, that figure, what those two figures are telling you is not that Africa has less than the rich world. In all probability, it's got more. Right? The rich world's been digging the stuff out for 200 years. It's still got $300,000 worth per square mile. And what it's telling you is that in Africa, there's been a lot less search. Right? Now, that means Africa and the other countries of the bottom billion, like Afghanistan, these are the last frontiers for resource discovery. And with high global commodity prices, that stuff is going to get discovered over the next decade or so. By hook or by crook, and probably by crook, that stuff will be discovered. Right? The challenge is then to harness it for development. Now, harnessing those huge revenues, which will dwarf aid, will dwarf remittances and foreign investment, this is the big money. Right? And potentially, it's Africa's own money. But to harness that for development requires governance, government decisions. There's an irreducible role for government. Now, unfortunately, in the poorest countries of the world, they're often weakly governed, and so very valuable natural resources meet and overwhelm rather weak governance. In the absence of effective governance, what happens to those natural resources is plunder. And plunder of natural resources takes one or other of two forms. Either the few expropriate what should belong to the many, or the present generation expropriates what should belong to the future. These are natural assets which should be passed on. So, the challenge is how to avoid the plunder of natural assets. And if we look at the history, it's not a very happy history. In fact, where better than Brussels to look at the history of natural resource extraction in Africa? 
Brussels, this beautiful city, its beautiful end of 19th century buildings were financed by the plunder of the Congo. Nowhere, nowhere was Europe's plunder of Africa more outrageous than right here. So, the challenge for Brussels in the 21st century, and it's a very appropriate setting, not just for the past, but for the future, because Brussels in the future is the scene of government policy coordination across the governments of Europe. And the challenge of the future is to get governance both in the developed countries and in the resource-rich low-income countries to avoid plunder, to make sure that the history of the 21st century is not a repetition of the history of the 19th. So, how do we avoid that repetition? Why is plunder so common in the past? Because harnessing natural resources for development is difficult. There's not just one decision. Harnessing for development depends upon getting a whole chain of decisions right. And we're quickly going to run through that chain of decisions. It's a chain in the sense of we're going to look at each link. And if any link breaks, we've got a broken chain. It's the weakest link problem. So let's start with that first link. That first link you already know is broken. The first link is discover your natural assets. In the past, we know that Africa and the other countries of the bottom billion haven't done that. Right? Let's get out of Africa for a moment and look at Afghanistan. The Americans very recently, for their own good reasons, actually spent the money on a geological survey of Afghanistan. It was front page of the New York Times a few months ago. A trillion dollars of subsoil assets in Afghanistan. A trillion. Right. Now, that quality of geological information, public geological information, is usually not available. It's only because of the peculiar current interest of America in Afghanistan that the public geological information was created. Right? As in Zambia recently, I talked to the government geologists in Zambia. They said, our latest public geological information dates from the 1950s. Right? With good public geological information, a government enormously increases its bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the resource extraction companies. You don't have to take that from me. Two weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to, to have a meeting with the CEO of one of the very biggest mining companies on Earth. And I put it to him, the idea that it would be a good idea for governments to get public geological information before they entered into negotiations with companies. And I thought I'd get some pushback from him. And instead, he said, but of course they should get good, good public geological information. They'd get better deals. He should know he's on the other side of the table. Right? So that's the first link in the chain. Improve the discovery process by investing in decent public geological information. Not a bad use for aid money. The second link in the chain, having discovered your natural resources, you've got to capture them for society. Capturing the value for society, avoiding plunder of type one, the few benefiting at the expense of the many, that depends both on physical control of the territory and on design of the tax system, a proper tax system. Let me give you a particularly egregious example of, the, of, 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 of a broken link there, and that is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which incidentally is neither very democratic nor really a republic, but it is the Congo. Um, Exports of gold from Eastern DRC, these figures come from the Financial Times, about a billion dollars a year, a billion. Revenues flowing into the Treasury from those exports, $37,000. When the New York Times reported a trillion dollars under Afghanistan, they contacted me and said, will you write an op-ed about what this means for Afghanistan? 
So I did. It started by saying, if they're as good at capturing it as the DRC is, this will buy a couple of helicopters. Right? So it doesn't have to be like that. Right? You can actually design a tax system which captures the bulk of the rents for the society. So discover your assets, tax them, then what you do with the revenues. The key choice here is savings versus consumption. What is obvious is that you're depleting an asset that doesn't just belong to the present generation. It should equally belong to the future. It's a natural asset. And so you should hand on value to the next generation. I met recently with the finance minister of Nigeria. His first question to me was, are we saving enough out of the oil revenues? And the honest answer is, at the moment, Nigeria, despite high world oil prices, all the oil revenue just meets recurrent expenditures. There are no savings from the oil revenues. Yeah? So, you don't need a, if you're a poor country, it doesn't make sense to save all the revenues, but a good proportion, perhaps about half. And let's move to that final link, which is what you do with the savings. And here, the, the benchmark model of global good practice is Norway, which, um, which takes the revenues, saves them, and hands them for safekeeping to those wise New York bankers. And that may make a lot of sense for Norway. Um, it makes some sense because Norway has got more invested capital per member of the labor force than any other country on earth. And so adding more capital in Norway, not much point in it. But for a country like Sierra Leone, just discovering oil, it will be obscene to acquire claims on the capital stock in America or Brazil. Sierra Leone should be investing in Sierra Leone. And then the final challenge is how do you do that? Because although these countries are pitifully short of capital, they're also pitifully short of the capacity to invest productively. And so the first stage in this long chain is actually the slow process of building the capacity to invest well, what I call investing in investing. There's the decision chain. It's got to hold the whole chain and not just once, but again and again, for at least a generation. Economic transformation from poverty to prosperity is possible, but it doesn't come quicker than about a generation. And so the challenge is how can that whole decision chain hold again and again? And here's the punchline of the talk. There is no substitute for building a critical mass of informed citizens within, within each of the societies that have these valuable resources and are currently poor. A critical mass of understanding. By a critical mass, I mean enough people that behavior changes, that the cruel past history of plunder is not repeated. History doesn't have to repeat itself. Societies can learn. Germany is currently the, the country in Europe most committed against inflation. And there's a good reason for that, because Germans lived through hyperinflation and don't want to repeat it. They learned never again. In the resource-rich countries of the poor world, in every one of them, there are brave people who are well aware of that past history of plunder and are struggling to change it. So what can we do to help build that critical mass of informed opinion? The idea that I floated in my little book, The Bottom Billion, was we could do a modest step, which was build what I call a natural resource charter, a set of guidelines and principles which lay out the decision chain in a way that's accessible for ordinary citizens and also accessible for the the people working in the different ministries. That, enough people read the bottom billion, they came round and said, we can do this, this is doable. And so 
a large group of ordinary citizens and some not quite so ordinary citizens, but all individuals, civil society, rallied round and built the Natural Resource Charter. The content you can all visit, naturalresourcecharter.org. It's a website. It's at four different levels, a set of 12 principles or precepts, a couple of pages on each principle aimed at journalists or ordinary citizens, much more detailed level on each principle aimed at, say, a permanent secretary in a ministry, and then a no more than the charter, what else should you be reading guide. It's been built by a wide collection of stakeholders and a long process of consultation, but it's controlled exclusively by the South. The board of the Natural Resource Charter, which has a total power over it, is headed by a Mexican, Ernesto Zedillo, former president of Mexico, who said, I saw oil destroy Mexico. I don't want it to destroy anywhere else. It's got two Africans, a Chinese, and an Egyptian. That's the Natural Resource Charter Board. Underneath that is a technical group headed by Nobel laureate in economics, Mike Spence. That's the, the governance structure. And now the challenge, which is why I'm here speaking to you today, is to take that set of international standards from, created from below to get it to spread virally amongst the, the people who need it most, which is especially young people, young citizens in these resource-rich, low-income countries. We're working with film companies run by young people. One of them was worked with a couple of weeks ago. They said, our last audience, we reached 400 million people. It's the young people of the world who understand the new technology. People like me, we don't. I remember giving this talk, first of all, in my own University of Oxford, and at the end of it, a young woman came up to me and said, it is on YouTube, is it? I said, I don't know. She sent me an email the next morning saying, it is now. <laughs> That's why I need you. Please help. Let's go back to where we started. This is the biggest opportunity for the poorest countries in the world to use their own resources to transform their lives from poverty to moderate prosperity. Yet if history repeats itself, that opportunity will be missed. Please play your part in making sure that it's not. Thank you.